Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for November 30th, 2021. Just one month of new, of 2021 left. I can't believe it. I know, right? I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is a webcast and podcast where we dig deep into the clutter that stands between people and the lives they want to be living. We aim to make sense of where so much stuff comes from in the first place, and we offer strategies to slow down the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we choose to keep. We rely heavily on the questions and topic suggestions we get from you, our viewers, and listeners. If you're new to the Zoom meeting, you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question yourself via audio or video. And we are streaming on Facebook as we usually do. So you can share your questions and comments there and I'll relay them to Gail. We're gonna start as we usually do by talking about last week's weekly tittle, which was called Creating a Vision Part Two. Part two. That was the second part of our homework about designing a vision for your home. And last week's assignment built on the previous week's efforts and incorporated elements of values, principles, dreams, and goals into your vision. We want to hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook who worked on their vision or started that process to design a vision this week. Please let us know in the comments. We heard from YouTube viewer Lindemar who shared this comment. Thinking about my vision for my home while listening to this has been really eye-opening. What I think I want and what actually supports the life I live are two different things. I think I'm going to have to, have to listen to the opening questions again. At the heart of what we wanted to accomplish with our series about creating a vision was encourage you to go beyond your habitual ways of thinking about your space. Instead, we hope that you'd carefully examine other overlooked but critical factors that contribute to having the life you want. You summarized that point beautifully when you said, what I think I want and what actually supports the life I live are two different things. Yes, they are. And we hope that you figure out what's most supportive of your lifestyle in that process. Being honest with yourself is really important while you're visioning what you want your new space to be and do and support you how you want it to support you in your life thanks for sharing we appreciate it m said in designing vision a problem was discovered it is mother's house that reminds me of what i want my apartment is about a fourth of the size of hers but my interests work and hobbies amount to many more than double hers when mm -hmm. she worked all the home space that she needed was for a single uniform and shoes my work is from home and involves computers hard drives piles of art supplies and sewing equipment and visual aids for lectures and photographs, in addition to more than one outfit of clothes. Plus, mother did not have an illness that required cooking all meals from scratch and prevented trips outside the house. You want to speak to some of those challenges? Sure. So the first thing I will say is um, clearly your parameters and her parameters do not gel, right? So you have uh, more problems to solve and more challenges to face around it and you have less space to work with so imagining that your house will look like your mother's is probably a wish a vibe that you can aim for if you can imagine that what you want to accomplish is a list that's much longer and more detailed than what she was trying to aim for then the idea that you would aim for your mother's house would require a lot more filtering and paring down of what you have to do and so I guess the question you're, you're trying to decide how much of the things are the parameters that you need to accomplish are immovable are necessary are permanent and how much of them have some flexibility that you can trim a little bit to fit better in your smaller space but I think ultimately your smaller space is the largest parameter that you have to work within, right? If you have much less space to work with, then that's going to be the thing that drives a lot of your decisions and focuses your goals because the space that you have to work with is a finite 
parameter. The department's not growing wings. It's not expanding. So you have to work with what you got in terms of size and make the functions that you want to happen there happen in that space. Ultimately, what happens when people are limited by their space, I end up talking to people about paring down how much back stock they have, paring down how far in advance they prep for food and having a big back stock of food becomes something to talk about based on how big your kitchen is in a small space, having, you know, 14 days or 30 days of back stock food becomes a problem because you don't have that place to store it. So you sort of have to um, accomplish the same. You still want to be able to cook for yourself, but you don't keep stock so far in advance as you would if you had more space to store things, stuff like that. So it becomes a, a sure you can still have the same. Uh, you can still aim for the things that you want in the house that are similar to your mom's house, but you may have to pare down the scale greatly. It may not look exactly the same. <laughs> I mean, in terms of clean space or clear space, you may have to have more things vertical, that kind of stuff. So I appreciate the dilemma there. And maybe it's just a matter of thinking about the vibe that your mother's house gives off. What's the vibe that makes it feel good to you? Imagine your mother's house. Do you love it because of the colors or do you, did you love it because of all the wide spaces or was it because the surfaces were clear or was it just because the, the furniture was a particular style that you liked? If you can figure out what about mom's house, other than the fact that your mother was in it, right? But what about mom's house felt warm, comforting, appropriate to you? And maybe you can just have that vibe, that feeling in mind as you plan your much smaller space. You can't just translate 100% or exactly, and but you can still give it the feeling. Number one is... I liked that it felt this way. Number two is I like this particular design. Number three is I like these particular pieces of furniture, you know, and then go from there. Right. I'd love to poll on this. How many people are living now in smaller spaces than the ones they grew up in? Real estate has gotten, you know, further out of reach for so many people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so a lot of people are in smaller homes than, than their parents raised them in. Leela said, my vision, easy to clean, welcoming to company, comfortable and peaceful, room to move around, bright and clean. Those are good vision. That's a good vision. And it's an adaptable one, right? Because you can, it can be peaceful in whatever peaceful looks like for you, right? So it's, it's very adaptable and uh, you can accomplish, you can do whatever you need to do to accomplish that goal. And when it feels peaceful to you, you're done, right? So <laughs> creating that should be fun. Linda reports, hey, y'all from Northeast Ohio. I have a couple spaces that are not sorted through, the holdovers. Okay. I, started, I started the door of the first space and spent the amount of time I could spend. At the end, I had Goodwill, trash, and in quotation marks, stuff my husband needs to decide about. <laughs> So the ball is moved forward. <laughs> Yay. That's awesome. And the stuff your husband needs to decide about, um, just be aware that that may be something that he will avoid doing. So you may have to negotiate a solution there about uh, enrolling him in the process. And um, I would also make sure that that isn't your default position so that you don't have to make a decision. So <laughs> if stuff that I have to, my husband has to decide, just pushes the decision off on him. There's something you can't go ahead and decide about even without his input. And no, you can't decide about his, uh, his stuff. If it's stuff that he, uh, that's his personally, then yes, he has to make his own decision about it. And if he's there, you know, depending on how enrolled he is in the process, if he's helping or doesn't want to help, then maybe you get to negotiate, okay, how do you get his focus to look at the stuff that you want him to? I don't want you to end up with a great big pile in the corner of things waiting for him to get on board. So um, address that sooner rather than later. And maybe you can make it in repeatable small bites so that he comes to it and spends a half an hour with you once a week and, and beats back the pile a little bit, even if he can't do all of it in one sitting. 
what would you think about subsetting some relatively easy stuff? Some some things where you think you know what his decision is going to be. Oh, good point. Segregate those things and say, okay, I need your decisions on this unless you want me to decide. So get his permission for, uh, you, you know, either get, solicit either his buy-in that he's going to take a look at this this batch, which you've guaranteed will be easy decisions for him, or his consent to delegate the decisions to you. And that creates sort of a, you know, you're describing creating a pile of low hanging fruit for him, right? Yeah. Because that that can be a quick way to reduce the volume um, and and not have it be an overwhelming pile for you to have to work around and get a whole bunch of stuff out in a hurry. And then the stuff that requires his more thoughtful de- deliberation or consideration, you can give it to him in smaller batches over time and let him look at it a little bit at a time. That's a great idea. Cause and, you know, the low hanging fruit process works for him just like it does for you in terms of getting volume out. And I think it was last week that we talked uh, about someone who was trying to get their husband's participation or buy-in i don't know if that was last week or the week before and easy oh it was last week talking about a garage and Mm, yeah easing you know easing him into participating in the process by giving him some a few simple choices to make first and not the whole pile yeah so then he has some decisions under his belt and Next time you have to ask, it will be less of a shock to him, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> less painful. Yeah. <laughs> Joyce says, my goal of clean and serene got a boost when I did some heavy duty cleaning before a friend's visit on Thanksgiving. Then I went to work cleaning my bedroom and the universe under my bed in preparation Ooh. for the delivery of my new mattress tomorrow afternoon. Home is not company ready, but at least it's generally respectable. I and- love the phrase the universe under my bed. I know. Right. And I love that you got a new mattress. Like that's a super excellent thing. Everybody needs to sleep well and new mattress helps that. And how great that you use the arrival of the new bed to trigger you to do some work around the bed. That's awesome. So congrats for facing up to that. And your reward is going to be a new bed. Woohoo! Always an exciting thing. That's wonderful. Congrats. Everybody's doing great. Lee says, goal, minimalistic might be unrealistic, but want a peaceful, light, accessible, and quick, clean home. There you go. And there's a, there's a broad spectrum on the way to minimalist, right? Like minimalist is a, is a really a narrow target at the end. And you can arrive somewhere along the spectrum that is a little bit closer to that, but not all the way there and still be happy and comfortable, right? So good for you okay we good should go prob- setting people we should probably get to our main topic okay times of flying our stuff becomes clutter when it stands in the way of other things that we want and need like relationships fulfillment comfort safety peace of mind Today, we're going to talk about situations Gail encounters frequently in her work in which clutter has kept clients from living the lives that they dream of. Then she'll examine those clutter blocks as the inspiration and starting point for setting new goals and planning organizing projects to address the clutter that stands in your way. We spent the last two weeks covering the idea of scripting a vision for your home space, how you want your home to function and feel to yourself and to others who visit you there. We're hoping you're well on your way to devising that vision and are ready to start thinking about making it a reality. And based on the comments that you've already made this morning, it sounds like you absolutely are. And I'm super proud of everybody for thinking about it that way. The next step after completing your vision is setting organizing goals that will help make that vision a reality. Now's the time to decide what changes need to be made to reach your vision. What specific projects need to happen? What organizing steps need completing? What tools or equipment need adding? What furniture and stuff need subtracting? What systems need revising? What needs to happen to realize your new vision? Those are the goals to set now for the new year. 
Even if you haven't articulated a vision for your space yet, you can still set goals for areas and functionality that you want to improve in your home. So today we want to offer some examples of specific goal setting ideas based on my experience as an organizer in people's homes. Some of these may be areas around which you're imagining a new vision and want to aim for the related goals. And let's start with an example. The vision idea number one, getting ready and out the door is easy and stress-free. For many of my clients, getting out the door dressed and ready on time is nearly impossible. There's a big scramble to find the clothes you want to wear, to be clean and presentable for work. Finding both of the shoes that you want is a problem. You go on a mad search for the cell phone and car keys. So what is making this task hard instead of the stress-free morning you dream of? Closet excess might be a problem. Can you even get into your closet? Is there any room to hang up clothes? If you can't get to your closet or your dresser, then the clothes back up onto the floor and the bed frame and the exercise machine and the doorknobs with no rhyme or reason as to where the clothes are or where they go when they're clean. It's a major hunt to find what you want to wear on any given day. Wouldn't it make getting dressed easier if you could walk into or up to your closet and know exactly where your pants are hanging? Scrambling, scrambling for clothes wastes your valuable morning time and starts out your day in a stressed way. Maybe you have problems dealing with the laundry. If your closet is, is inaccessible or your dresser drawers are full and you have a bunch of clothes on the floor, I bet you're getting dressed from the dryer or pulling stuff out of the laundry hamper. I was just in a teenage boy's room and mom was doing the laundry and making him come and get it, but he was just dumping it on the floor because he currently can't get into his closet. <laughs> clean clothes on the floor of a boy's room don't stay clean long. And when your laundry room or the floor is your closet, getting dressed is a lot harder. <clears throat> uh, what about the chaos on your bathroom counter? Does the bathroom counter make things difficult in the morning? If the counter's covered in cleansers and makeups and supplements in no particular order, I'll bet it slows you down. I'm not a morning person and anything that requires me to think harder makes easing into my day really stressful. My bathroom works for me because I can be barely conscious and still know where to find the hairbrush and the Q-tips and the deodorant. <laughs> Finding the keys in the phone are a problem sometimes for people in the morning. Are you searching for it every time you leave the house? Sometimes this takes two minutes and sometimes it takes 15 minutes. And the longer it takes, the more panicked you get because you have timed your departure down to the minute and you don't have 20 spare, spare minutes to find things. Being able to walk over and pick up your keys and phone without fail every time would be a big relief. So the new vision is to get ready and out of the house without stressing. And high level goals to achieve that vision include clearing up the closet, setting up a purse and key station, fixing any issues with the laundry situation, and organizing the bathroom for ease of use. Now, please note that each of the goals is a project in itself and we'll have several steps to achieving it. You're looking for the goal targets first. And then the steps to each goal are your to-do list, your task list that you're gonna work on to get accomplish that goal. Okay, so here's the next example, vision idea number two. I can easily cook meals and clean up afterwards. Lots of my clients say they like to cook, but can't because their kitchen isn't functional. That means they eat a lot of takeout, which costs more and negatively affects their weight. So what's the point of a kitchen if you can't use it to cook food? <laughs> what blocks are preventing you from using the kitchen as you want? Maybe there's no counter space and that means no space to prepare food. You can't really prep food in midair. You need a clean surface somewhere or you can't really cook and feed for yourself. Washing dishes may be a problem. If your cabinets are all full and there's stuff on the counter, I'm guessing your sink is constantly backed up with dirty and or clean dishes. You can't put things away into full cabinets, so you can't clear your sink and counter. And we're back to there's no room to prep and no room to cook without a clear counter. Using the food in the pantry, if you can't reach the pantry or it's overstuffed, then you might as well have no food in the house because you can't get to what you have in order to cook it. How much food gets thrown out because it's so far out of date when you finally unearth it? I just did this in a pantry this weekend. Most of the clients just keep adding more to the pantry and rebuying the same things over and over again without using them until I show up. 
And then we empty the pantry as a project and throw out hundreds of dollars of expired food all at once. You don't want to waste your food budget that way. So the new vision is that you want to cook, eat, you want to easily cook meals and be able to clean up afterwards. <clears throat> then the associated main goals are you want to clear access to and clean up, clean out the pantry. You want to uncover your kitchen counters, except for vital appliances, vital appliances and supplies. And you want to organize the kitchen cabinets in the drawers for easy access to dishes and pots and pans and silverware and all of the things you need to stir and cut and mix all those little extra pieces that you work with. You want to set up the sink and the dishwasher for easy cleanup. That's a really good project list for the kitchen. And the, the goal, the end result of all that project work in the kitchen will be that you can get in there and make food easy and keep up with it and find what you need in the pantry, which is your original vision. So my last example is vision idea number three. It's about hosting a house guest and or on overnight stays. So maybe the vision is the family visits for holidays and out of town friends come to visit too. You can't socialize with them if your house has no rooms for guests to sleep or bathe. And if you're too embarrassed to your house for, by your house to let anyone in, then we need to figure out what's making this a problem for you. If your guest room gets used as an overstuffed office or a junk room, then there's no adaptable sleeping space for guests to comfortably use. What about seating for a group of people to chat? Those visitors have to sit somewhere for you to gab and catch up and drink wine. <laughs> So the couch has to be clear or the dining table needs to be clear so your guests can sit down. That's not easily done if the table is a storage area or the chairs are covered in laundry or the couch is buried in stuff. That overnight guest will need a bathroom for sure. So let me give you a list of things I've seen stored in bathtubs or showers over the years. File boxes full of papers, a rolling file cart, Clothes on a storage rack, like one of those pole racks to hang clothes on, standing inside the bathtub. Uh, bottles of wine. <laughs> I thought that was an innovative place to store the wine. <laughs> Holiday decorations. This is a weird one. Empty boxes of cat litter, not full boxes of cat litter. Boxes out of which the cat litter had been poured, and then the boxes were stored in the bathtub. Did not understand the process on that one. So that's the recycling area? Apparently it was the recycling area, but it didn't make sense to me because it, it was just kept getting fuller. It was never empty. That was the problem. Um, decorative pillows. I've seen a rack, a row of decorative pillows in the bathtub, stacks of dog beds. So a shower used as a storage unit cannot be used by your guests. So that is one of the impediments to guests being there. So the new vision is that you want your family and friends to visit and stay overnight. So the goals to achieve this vision are to define a sleeping space for guests, even if it's in a shared use room that can be easily set up when the guests are coming to visit. You want to create an inviting, comfortable seating area for you and your guests to gather for those long catch-up chats. And you want to spruce up the guest bathroom or make it easy for guests to use a shared bathroom. Now you have a list of projects to work on to reach your vision about guests. These are just examples of creating goals from the vision you have of your ideal house and what you want, want it to function like going forward. Like we said at the beginning, our stuff only becomes clutter when it stands in the way of other things we want and need to do. To sum up the goal setting process we're suggesting, examine the areas of your life where you're not getting what you want or not accomplishing what you'd like to do because of the cluttered space. If you've done the vision exercise, then you have the ideas to focus on already. Isolate the specific ways in which clutter gets in your way. How is the space contributing to the problem or prevents your vision of the space from being a reality? Set a goal for an improved area and lay out a timetable to get there. Design the project. And in other words, I mean, make the task list to organize towards your goal or adjust your habits or the way you use your space? What are the specific steps that you need to do to get to your goal? Now you're ready to dive in for the new year and improve your home. Don't let the things that aren't working quite right in your life make you feel like you've, you're failing. 
Instead, use them to pinpoint specific issues that need your attention and outcomes you want to accomplish. You're much more likely to reach goals if you can state them clearly, then make detailed plans for how to achieve them. An example, get my house organized is less clear and much harder to accomplish than get the kitchen and the dining room ready for dinner guests. You can make these goals happen and we're, we'll be here to help all along the way. And I can't wait to hear how your goals are working, how you're working towards your goals in the new year. Angelica <laughs> reports, my husband and I made a little progress in the garage this week, but he seemed very scattered while we were working. I need help on how to focus him on one spot. One thing that you can do to keep other areas of the garage from distracting him, um, it might be that um, particular areas are more interesting to him so if you think that's what's going on then I would go work in the area that's interesting to him to help keep his focus or if it's just that he sees more and therefore he's distracted by what's around him then you can do things like take the stuff that you need to work on and pull it out into the driveway so that he's not in the garage while he's working on what you have or you can get out sheets or tarps or uh, any kind of a canvas and throw over. Imagine if there's a big pile of stuff and you cover a whole bunch of it with a blanket or a tarp or whatever, and then you just fold back a corner to work on. It's a way that people use in houses. If you're ADD or you're really overwhelmed, not being able to see everything helps you stay focused and also helps cut down the overwhelm. And so maybe you need to stand him in a particular area and then blanket a few areas around him, immediately around him, so that he can't, when he looks over to his right, he sees a white sheet or a blue canvas instead of a, a, another pile of stuff. I imagine that you can't blanket your entire garage, but the idea is to blanket the areas immediately around the areas that you're working so that it's less distracting for him. Um, some people really, it's hard to do in the garage, but some people really find removing themselves from the cluttered area and working in some place clean is easier. And the only, you know, that's easier done in the house than in the garage because that actually means carrying a bunch of stuff out onto the driveway to work on it. <clears throat> but you can experiment and take a few things out or take one box out or take one little pile out and let him work on that on the driveway and see if that allows him to be distracted. And I would sort of physically, you know, if you, if you do that, have him stand so that his back is to the garage. So he's seeing the, what's in front of him and your driveway. <laughs> and, then, and maybe that will help him not be as distracted. Without actually watching him, um, uh, those are the best examples I can give you in the moment. Keep reporting back and I'll keep refining the instructions for you. <laughs> okay. Um, lots and lots of people in the chat have responded that they live in smaller spaces than the ones they grew up in. There you go. In fact, I don't think anyone has, has said otherwise. Every, I think everyone who answered said, yes, much smaller space. But then they also frequently said, and I had this many siblings and, you know, now it's just me and the husband or the, right. the, me and me and the husband and the one child. Um, Let's see. Instead of eight people in the house, there's only two. Yeah. Yeah. Makes and sense. Th but that, you know, you, it, you do. And even though that's an obvious just reality of how your life is different from your, from your parents, you still may have to process through the differences that that enforces upon your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't maybe you can't have the formal dining room or the living room that was reserved only for company or right that no one was allowed to go in <laughs> yeah <clears throat> um returning to the subject of vision um samudra said my goal is to be able to know exactly where everything is 
that Isn't is a that great wonderful? goal that is yeah. a great goal and you should think about it in terms of you know imagine that you you own ten thousand things ten thousand specific items so it isn't that you know 100% where every actual thing is. It's more that you know where the categories of things are. Like, I know where that all my bathroom stuff is in this cabinet. I know that all of my uh, food is in the pantry. I know that all of my bedding and linen is in this closet. So that even if you can't remember a specific sheet set, you know that the sheet sets are all in one place that kind of um that's sort of a sub goal <laughs> and if you can get down to you have so little that you can remember where every actual thing is you win the prize that is an excellent goal and if you can accomplish that excellent also on vision sandy said welcome and peaceful pleasing to my eye sustainable sustainable is an excellent one to point out to yourself right because there's all kinds of things that might be pleasing to the eye that are super difficult to maintain and so deciding that you want it to be pleasing and also sustainable gives you some better parameters about what you you want it to be peaceful and pleasing to look at but you don't want it to be a ton of work to get there so that's a great refinement actually and smart It'll help you. It'll help you filter better. And sustainable may mean multiple things to you as well. Um, it can mean it, it won't cost much to keep it the, the way it is. I won't produce a lot of waste. I won't consume a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. um, All of that. I, yeah, I, I, my, I, I will be able to put forth the effort it will take to keep it looking this way yeah i won't have to spend all of my day trying to keep it up um returning to uh, m who was talking about um who started the conversation about comparing her mother's house to her present circumstance said what i liked the most about mother's house was besides the open classy look was that she had a work area for everything she wanted to do if you needed anything, you knew exactly where it would be. That's useful. So you can still do that in a smaller space. It just means that you have you have more smaller spaces and more areas dedicated to the because your list was longer of all of the the topics that you need to be prepared for. And in a smaller space, that means that you don't get to give as much spread out real estate to each area, right? And maybe some of that real estate is just that it goes up the wall or it's in a specific place in the closet or something. So <clears throat> it is possible to accomplish it and you just do it on a much smaller scale, right? So it may be a little tight and you may want to, um, you know, share some space, <laughs> like having more, see if there's related things that can be put together and um, having a space share to accomplish more than one thing overlapping purposes mm -hmm. yeah exactly um it, it, it is part of the challenge of having zones dedicated zones in a smaller space it's possible it's just uh the more zones you got to have the less space they get <laughs> it's basically what happens <coughs> excuse me um catherine says my vision is to keep eliminating the unnecessary or seldom used so that when the inevitable inevitable time comes that I can no longer drive and have to move, it will be quick and easy move for my kids to help me with. Right. That's a great goal. That's a really good goal. And that's thinking about the ease of your future self and your kids. And that's really wonderful. And, you know, do it now while you can. And then packing will be easier and it'll be less stressful and that's an excellent goal. Joy says, I have a cluttered bathroom sink area, but everything's organized in longer burger baskets that I've had for years. So I can pick up the baskets easily for cleaning. That's good. And if you, if the, if you have more than one basket and each basket has a theme, then that's organizing as well. If there, if your system is all of the hair stuff is in here and all of the, I'm making it up, but all of the 
medicines are in here, however you break it up amongst the baskets, um, then you're helping yourself there as well. Um, I would tell you that when people adopt containers like that and they fill it up, then they sort of um, over time forget what's in there. And so part of your maintenance can be every once in a while pulling everything out of the basket and looking at it and going, yeah, I tried this flavor and I'm never going to use it again. I don't like it. And so that you can filter the contents regularly instead of always just adding new stuff in. If you filter the contents and pull out things that are no longer relevant, you'll keep those baskets functioning well for you. Ginger says garages. The entire footprint of our home is garage. My husband is a woodworker hobbyist and very organized there. Zones for everything. And he's built organization racks. Very Inside cool. the garage? I, yes, I think that's what she's saying. That's awesome. That's great. Well, you definitely can't woodwork in the house. <laughs> so right, it's, right. <laughs> it's good that he's got it uh, happening in there. That's wonderful. Um, Nicolette asks... What can I do with decision fatigue? I have so much stuff. It is so overwhelming. So I put it off. So no guests can come. So decision fatigue is definitely a problem. And you have to figure out how long you can go before you really start to have negative impacts of I'm trying to make decisions now. I'm too tired. So this is where recognizing that the whole project is not accomplishable in one sitting and that you need to eat the elephant one bite at a time, right? You just need to be putting in consistent effort over whatever amount of time you can function well going forward. <clears throat> and that involves, can I sit for an hour and work on it and then walk away? Can I sit for 30 minutes and work on it and walk away? Whatever length of time you can stay focused and make decisions without feeling burnt out completely, setting that amount of time i'm going to do 90 minutes today i'm going to do 90 minutes every day until it'll take you a while but if you focus on areas where guests are going to stay or visitors to the house are going to sit then you can clear up even if you can't clear the whole house you can still clear enough and be comfortable enough that you can let people come in the house and sit down and have coffee with you and have a chat and so you want to figure out how long you feel comfortable working before you give up, before you feel like your decisions become blocked, useless, <laughs> slow. You know, at what point does the crank just start to really slow down and limit yourself beyond that? Don't go out that far when you work and have your work sessions be how long you can manage without losing capacity, basically. And then schedule those every day. Or maybe, you know, do it once in the morning and once in the afternoon. If you really are trying to be aggressive about getting to your goal, um, you can do a little bit twice a day if you want and see if you can get there that way. Ultimately, you're never going to be able to sit down and do the whole project from start to finish all day in all of your waking hours until you get to the end. Like nobody can do that. And so it's just a matter of what time limit do you have where your decision making capacity really starts to fall off and you need to stop before you get there and give yourself that little work assignment every day until you get far enough that people can come visit you. Okay. I want to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, we actually had a, we had a question about getting ready for a move and we, that's a, that's a big topic that we can't dive into right now, but Gail and I are working on a project to, categorize our videos into uh, playlists by topic so that it's a little easier to find a specific set of videos that you might want to look look for and and moving packing and moving is one of the first ones we've been working on and so if you go to our youtube channel which gail is going to show you the sign for <laughs> visit cfhou.com slash YouTube and look for our packing and moving playlist. Yeah. And we'll be adding adding more play. There, there are several playlists there now and we'll be adding some more in the near future. In the meantime, the Clutter Fairies Guide to Packing is out there. <laughs> well, also- Getting ready for a move. There's a video about that. And the search functions on YouTube are pretty good too. So mm -hmm. while you're, go to our channel and 
just search on moving, packing. The uh, word move. Yeah, the word move, mm -hmm. and you will find several videos Sometimes on that topic. We've talked about it before. Let's talk about the weekly tittle. Okay, so the tittle this week is practice makes progress. This week's assignment is to practice turning your long-term vision into clear goals and actionable decluttering projects. If you've worked through the last two weekly titles, then you want to select an element of the vision for your home on which you'd like to focus. If you don't have a clear vision for your home yet, then just select an activity or a function that you'd like to be able to do with more ease or enjoyment. Make a list of one or more obstacles or impediments that stand in the way of your achieving the element of your vision or the activity that you've selected in the previous steps. <clears throat> Choose one item from your list of obstacles to which you'll apply your attention this week. You may pick the low hanging fruit or the worst roadblock or any other task on your list. Commit to making progress on the task this week. If every obstacle on your list feels overwhelming, then you probably should adjust your scope. Take one of the obstacles and break it down into smaller parts and then make a commitment to addressing one of those subtasks this week. So the idea is just to somewhere in your list of goals, pick an area that needs some work and start working on it. <laughs> and then come back and tell us how it went. And we will be here to hear your tales. One more comment I'd like to share from Linda, who is with us on Facebook. Linda says, for me, remembering that my life has seasons and my home is a reflection of that. For example, I no longer have toddlers who mess up areas faster than we can tidy. My season, <laughs> my season currently allows me more time to go through stuff, realizing that another season will come along and the decision process will change based on those needs. Yeah, and I think that... Um recognizing that your life has seasons and that there's detritus that goes with the seasons is one of the shifts in thinking that people have to make instead of just keeping the detritus from the previous season and adding it to <laughs> adding it to the pile and add and starting the new season um, you have to shift gears and let go of an old season stuff as you move into the new season and that thought process and and change in focus is something that people have to learn as they get older and own more and go through more seasons. I want to remind everyone that we will be back the same time next week, Tuesday, December 7th at noon U.S. Central Time, live on Zoom and streaming on Facebook. It's easy to get confused as you navigate the blurry boundaries between decluttering, organizing, and ticking off your routine cleaning and maintenance chores. In our next episode, we're going to clarify distinctions between clearing clutter, organizing, and tangential household tasks, and we'll offer strategies for keeping focus as you pursue your organizing goals. Please join us next week for Distractions and Distinctions, Finding Focus in Your Organizing Efforts. There's a great conversation going on in the chat. Leela shared, I started getting rid of flat surfaces, LOL. That was the only way I succeeded with the battle. I, right? I, missed, I, I think I've missed a, co a comment that went before that, but I just love that, getting rid of flat surfaces. <laughs> right? If there's a space, then you can park stuff on it. <laughs> That's great. I, she says, I still can't seem to keep the kitchen table clear. When I started decorating for the holidays this week, I realized how few surfaces I have left for setting holiday decor on. Oh, there you go. That means you've accomplished your goal though, doesn't it? Like that's good. That means you've narrowed it down so it's not easy to put stuff down. That's excellent. She said, I was, I sold or donated. I was frustrated by a shelf full of junk and couldn't decide what to declutter. For example, I gave the bookshelf to my neighbor and was forced to pare down the junk as I had to find new places to house the items. There and you go. any small furniture like tiny stools and end tables left my house awesome that is so awesome and i've seen some precarious piles in my in my organizing career let me just tell you people that just like stack things on whatever flat surface and then they build this creaky tower of things that they don't think really hard about they just keep going and putting stuff over there and eventually it's very unstable and it all falls over and then they have a big mess to clean up and so i have um, 
I applaud your recognizing that flat surfaces are dangerous for you. That's excellent. Okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live to get notifications about upcoming events. We invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. We had a whole bunch of new meetup members this week, something like 15 new members just this week. Goodness. <clears throat> and welcome to all of you. Yeah, you can thanks. also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us, and you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairyhouston.com. We are so happy that you came and listened to us talk today. Thanks so much, and we will be back here next week talking about what's the difference between decluttering and organizing and cleaning and hopefully help you get focused on what you need to be doing. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.